enough. Months is enough. You know, I'm jumping all over the place, but uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> some, some of them weren't good at all. Uh, the, especially the Germans, uh, or even in the year. The Aitais, you'd see the Aitais uh, back from the front line a bit. Uh, and they were spies because they used to seem to drive a mob of ship, sheep over the hill and next thing you'd be getting shelled from all over the place. And, and also they used to put um, mines under dead soldiers so that when they were picked up they would knock the people about who were picking them up. Yeah. And, you know, it was, um, of course, uh, other, other than front line work, um, when you got pulled out for a spell, uh, in lots of cases, you still had work given to you to do, like there was always hospitals back behind the front line where the, the, men, the men who were, who were wounded were immediately taken to those places by the uh, ambulance boys. Uh, from, right from the front line on stretches back to the ambulances and then the ambulance would take them back to the hospital. And then if any troops were handy enough to the hospital, uh, I was one of them, you would arrive there in, in an army truck, half a dozen of us, and you had to pick up the dead bodies from, from the hospital who were wrapped in, in blankets and tied with wire and carry them and put them in the trucks and then the trucks would take them to a place where there was already some other soldiers who had dug graves for them and they would be buried there. That would be only a temporary place to be buried but you, you, you're standing in a truck hanging on to the top of the, the tarpaulin on the top of the ridge and that standing astride a dead body, you know, because there wasn't much else with other room to, to be. You know, they're those sort of things that... Uh, mm. uh, and then they would... Any dead soldier that was killed in action, like up in the front line, they always took his tags off and took his rifle and put a bayonet on and stuck it up into the sand upside down and put his tags on. So uh, he was left there as soon as ever the, 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 the war moved on from there, the special squads would come along and remove those bodies and take them back. And they know exactly who they were by looking at them, we call them the big tags, you know, and they were on the rifle. So uh, they kept, then there was a, after the war, of course there was the special uh, war graves commission, they collected them all, as you know, and, and uh, put them in decent sort of graves. I also uh, had time when I was up in Palestine, when I had that yellow jaunters, I had time to go to the 1914-18 cemetery. That's the place I went to. And that's a, that's a tremendous big place, it's, uh, you know, and the buildings in there, it's, it's really an eye-opening, but rows and rows and rows of, of the First World War all the uh, world, world war songs. I'll get it to the moment. I need it eventually. <laughs> yes, um, it's because through Palestine I went right through uh, the biblical part of it, uh, the church of nativity and uh, the ways of the cross and all those sort of places that I didn't uh, know too much about uh, that in those days, but uh, it's very nice to have been there. <clears throat> where were you? Where were you when the war ended? How did you? How did you hear about it? We we the war was. We're talking. See, um, I got up as far as um, Venice. I think, uh, of course, the New Zealand troops went up a bit further than that, but uh, they were already on that on that move. Uh, Venice, as far as I got, uh, when the war ended, of course, we heard about the, when we were in Italy, we heard about the 
the, the hydrogen bomb that was dropped on Japan. And that, that was some wonderful news because they told us it was only so many pounds weight and, you know, you could carry it if you wanted to, sort of style. And I thought, fancy that and I'm blowing up a whole city, you know. And uh, but we'll be home soon, we'll be home soon. Because the Aussies went home before we did. But uh, you're talking about you know, in the coal, and once again, we, we kept ourselves warm in Italy. We had little pup tents. And we used to get, uh, get fairly sizable tins. And there was plenty of charcoal in Italy. They make charcoal by cutting logs and trees down and putting one in the middle in a stake and lying all the logs and building it up to some more enormous big thing like a big door around this building here, you know. But they leave a cavity in the middle and they set it alight. No, cover it all with soil when they're finished. And they put a light and leave it there for weeks and it smoulders and when it's ready they take the soil off and it's just this is complete solid charcoal. And the Italians used it a lot and it was plentiful. And we used to get these tins with a handle on and we'd light a fire and put this charcoal out and get it going and swirl it around until it got red hot and you know, it was just glowing. And then we'd take that into our tent. The Italians used to cook on it too. There's the big basin on the floor, the peasants in Italy, when during the snow, when we couldn't do anything, we used to go and visit the, the, the families and they used to take us in and give us some of their uh, spaghetti and stuff. Of course, I make it a bit different. It was very nice. But they used to fill it up with charcoal and cook their meals on it. No, in a fireplace, that's right. And when they finished, they'd scrape it all into a big bowl and put it in the middle of the floor and we'd all sit around it. And if you stoke it now and again, it come red hot. It's a great fire, yeah. So it, we had the same with our, gave us the idea of having one in a tin and putting it inside the tent. And it kept you warm. But yeah, because the big experience there, when you got out of your tent, the tent was like that, covered in snow, and you walk along and you go three feet down a city, because it was all full of stuff. You wouldn't know it was there. <laughs> oh dear. But oh, we spent a lot of time in, 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 in uh, uh, Castle Fontana, that's right, and the first, the first action that the Kiwis had was, I think, was Casino. Oh, no, not Casino, uh, Sangro, and that was a river, and we had to go across a river, uh, because the German was on the other side. And, and they had that a story, they had a racket going there that the Germans would say, is that you, Bill? Talk, talk English, I suppose. And, but it was the two Jerry's were talking, you know. And the, it was some, something we picked up that uh, it let us know that there were, there were Germans or whatever. But uh, not a very nice place. It was The Germans had caught, once again, they were there before and retreated covered the place all the sides of the roads with, with mines. Uh, I can know one, one very good friend of mine. Uh, he, the road was built up in crossroads and the road was, because there was these four depressed areas each side of the crossroads. And he got down there neck to wolf. And of course they had to take him out. And, uh, he, he said, he said, you'll tell my mother, won't you, you know, of course, so, anyway, coming, coming back, this mate of mine, he, you know, he was sent back, a jeep pulled up, just say how things will happen, a jeep pulled up, and said, you want to lift back, back to Kiwi base, and he said, well, I won't be long, you hop in, and he went round on the other side of the west, and he told him the mine. So, yeah, yeah, it's um, things like that. that oh, that's your, we'll see that for he, he was Catholic, and he said to his mate before, he said, I've got to go into action tonight. That was the night before we went in. He said, can I borrow your rosary beads? And he let him have your rosary beads. 
And I don't know whether they ever got them back or not. Uh, yeah. Sad place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Of course, yes, it's, it's, warfare is, is, is a very hard thing to talk about, unless you've been a, a real top soldier and you've been right through the thick of it and the front of it and all that sort of medicine. That's why some of these wrote good PCs and they earned every penny, penny of it. But uh, <clears throat> we went in for a night attack uh, just to see where the enemy was because, or what strength, you go in on foot and you go as close as you can, probably a platoon with, it, with an officer. And there's no, no noise, you go as quietly as you can. <coughs> but uh, you might be, keep on going, nothing happens. You see some tanks and you, you expect it to take some tanks, but you, you can't do, but uh, you've been out on a recce and, and you've notified that and you take that information back. That's how some of the information is picked up before a, a big attack happens. Um, <laughs> we had one bloke, he was a runner and he, he, he didn't make it all the way but he was game enough to stop behind and wait to meet this when we come back. <laughs> I would never have done it. But on the way back, he could see these soldiers coming back in line from there. And he stood up, who goes there, he said. You know? <laughs> and the bloke alongside me had a machine gun, and he whipped that off, and he fell the light. You know, he could have shot him to pieces. <laughs> so I don't know how this bloke do these sort of things once, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. And uh, that is, uh, uh, I'm talking about my experience, like it's these little things that was, I was in, you know. Um, like even in in, uh, in Torelli, that was back behind Cairo. That place fell seven times, backwards and forwards, with the Yanks. Uh, the, the Kiwis hadn't attacked at that time because they were busy on the front with the casino portion of it. But I'm talking about that because I was in there up there with the mule, mules. And you get a bit cheeky and you roam around, and uh, which I did. And you come across dead soldiers. And they were Negro soldiers. And they've been there for about a week, I suppose. But it's pretty hot, of course. The place was say seven, seven times, and they hadn't bothered me had time to really clear it. The biggest fright I ever got, or the nastiest fright, was a big burnt-out American tank. And I, I was having a look around, and I got up on, on, on the tracks and looked down the, into the tank, this is true, ghastly. There was a, a skeleton in there, burnt, with just teeth showing, you know, lying. What a fright you get when you, you know, but he'd hit a mine and it blew his, blew his tank up and burnt him. But just these little innocent things that you, you come across. In the, in the uh, yeah, in the warfare.